Difa Davo asks or says, I have a gym teacher at school who harasses me about head up when I squat and knees can't go over the toes. Can I just pause? There's a gym teacher that you guys are squatting with? Like that's kind of cool. Uh, I went looking for studies to help me back to help me back to back me up. Uh, but he's not having it. Any trial studies, experiments that I can use other than anecdotally comparing the injury rate among professional athletes in powerlifting versus mainstream sports? There is not going to be data on comparing head up and head down positions in the squat or where your knees go in the squat. Uh, and even your uh, injury rates, yeah, that doesn't exist. Probably are not gonna. And that support, doesn't. <laughs> yeah, it's not gonna support what you're trying to say. So um, you just need to squat the way you're gonna squat, and then, you know, forget about that guy. So yeah, exactly. It, it, the argument, the argument is not even worth having with someone in that situation if they're quote not having it. Then just don't just just don't keep have it training, either. do what you're gonna do, and yeah, <laughs> just don't you have it. Just, you 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 are. Uh, you are uh, perfectly able to be just as stubborn as he is. So there you yeah. go. Just ask him to leave you alone nicely, and then if he says if he refuses, then you say, "Hey, I'm going to tell people that you asked me to take my pants off." <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I'm just look, man. I imagine this person's in high school, right? And so you can't really tell the gym teacher <laughs> who's like you know cruising around the weight room to buzz off. Yeah. Actually, yeah, I, I, I don't really have the, I guess it's, maybe this is a high school student. I don't know. But anyway. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Let's continue. <laughs> Darkobotic says, hi, guys. Absolutely love everything you're doing. I cannot thank you enough for the years of sharing the knowledge and helping me educate myself and my clients. Before I ask, I just need to say this very briefly. In a period of four years, since 2010, I've lost 200 pounds. Nice. Nice. Uh, when I started training, lifting uh, lifting only a barbell was a very difficult task. I'm a beginner personal coach now. I love training as a power lifter, although I am not one. However, I'm gradually but steadily getting weaker because I'm still battling a huge ambivalence between my appearance and proper strength. This is something that I helped a lot of people with, but I am absolutely terrible in giving myself the same advice. I am in an endless cal uh, caloric deficit or maintenance at best. People and clients expect me to look the certain way, and personally, I care how I look. But I also love pursuing strength and making myself better in the process. However, I am getting weaker due to inconsistency that stems from the fact that I cannot remain in a caloric surplus for an extended period of time. In case you understand how crippling this ambivalence is, and if you even consider addressing this, I would only ask for an advice. For advice. In any case, thank you for everything, Darko. I'm going to let you take this one. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think, you know, ultimately you just have to identify what turns you on man what's what's your what makes you tick you know if if you are telling me you know and you're being honest that you really care about your strength progression you know i i think it's very going to be very difficult to support to support a, a training um demands that strength training strength training requires um on the other hand if being you know looking a certain way is more important and uh, you're gonna make the rationalization that you have to look a certain way in order to to earn a living earn a wage and i don't necessarily disagree with you at the low level of personal training um then i i think you just have to say accept that you're not gonna get as strong as you otherwise would you should still train regardless mm -hmm. so anyway you need to adjust your programming in a way that helps you at least get a little bit stronger, but not at the pace that you otherwise might, and you need to be okay with that. Yeah. Exactly. But I think the main thing here, this is just psychiatric stuff, right? Yeah. And in general, the way I think about this is whenever I see somebody say something on Instagram, I know that they're struggling with that thing, right? Mm -hmm. So you have the girls that post the butt shots, and then there's a, 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 a Bible quote, and under that they say, I, you know, <laughs> I almost didn't post this because it's so risque. It was like, no, look. You definitely were going to post this. You're definitely looking for external validation. Like, I don't need to read the paragraph underneath telling me about your self-image issues. I think, you know, whatever makes you feel good, that's cool. Like, let's just be upfront about it, right? Yeah. So, so you know, Darko, you may have a body image issue, and I don't think that's necessarily unexpected given your journey. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the way to free yourself from that um, is, is this sort of self-realization that, only you have the uh, ability to make yourself feel better or worse. If you think that your value completely stems from how you look, then you're going to be chasing and serving that God, um, and it'll always own you. But once you free yourself from that, then you can move on with your life. Because honestly, at this stage of the game that you and I are at, Austin, 
I mean, we could say that certainly our, you know, maybe being strong at a certain body weight has uh, given us a certain market or a certain amount of attention or whatever. But I, the pre- people I go to for advice, I, I don't care what they look like. And I actually don't really care how strong they are. I just want to know they understand the process. Yeah. Right. That's who I'm looking for, for expert level advice. So, all right. Train with Brent. The gram has everyone fantasizing about abs and ass. How do you guys shift your clients' priorities to strength training? I don't want to just turn them away because their money is green and I need to eat. (laughs) Actually, I think this guy lives in San Antonio. He was trying to come train. Brent, you need to come train, dude. Come train. Um, So, yeah, you know, we we are fortunate to an extent in that our services uh, end up kind of selecting like people the people who come to us are kind of pre-selected they've kind of oftentimes already bought into what we're doing um they don't necessarily i I can speak for myself more than for jordan maybe he has more people coming to him who are fantasizing about their own abs and ass is anybody not fantasizing about it i mean i'm just saying like what's the i mean i mean what they're pursuing oh 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 oh, oh. specifically not just general fantasies there (laughs) not just general i see yeah yeah, so, so oftentimes we're not in a position where we need to convince people that they should be strength training. Uh, so, you know, I, will, I don't actually go out there with the mission of trying to save all these people necessarily. If they right. come to me and that's what they're interested in, I'll explain to them what I have to offer and I can explain to them how what I have to offer might help them get to where they want to be. Um, and if they're not interested, then I don't necessarily push it because it's not worth it. There are too many other people out there who need, who need help getting strong. And, uh, you know, if people are really bought into, you know, say like the, the, you know, getting on the NPC bikini show or something, then I'm not, a, I'm not a coach who's going to be able to help you with that. Sorry. So, yeah, yeah I think, um, well, you know, a lot of our, our skills, there's just tools in a toolbox, right? So I find that, you know, even if somebody is really into, you know, getting leaner or, you know, build, you know, making their butt a certain way, I find that I have the skill, I have the tools to do so. I think ultimately we're fighting a mental disconnect, you know, and people yeah. think they need this like booty pump program and that's going to do the thing. And I'm like, no, nah, no, that girl's had that butt for her whole life or ever <laughs> since she surgically afforded yeah. it. Um, yeah. And if you want to build your own, well, you're going to have to squat, and here's the most effective way to do so, particularly given your previous exposure to training. So all you're doing is giving these people your your expert opinion, right? So that makes you have to be the expert. Just the, a consultant in the matter. Yeah, for the abs thing, you know, it's, this is a leanness sort of situation. And so ultimately, you're giving these people expert-level advice, and they can either take it or leave it. And, and you know, I think the good thing about our practices is we just self-select for people we want to work mm-hmm. with anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, cause if somebody came in and said, no, I can't gain any weight and I don't want to put the bar on my back and I don't want to, you know, lift the weights and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them, but we just won't work. And, yeah. and, and so instead of, you know, training this person and every time I interact with them, I want to, you know, suck, start a pistol. We just don't end up working together. Yeah. So, so I think there are enough people in this world who want to do what you want to do, Brent, or what you want to coach that you don't have to necessarily take, take people who refuse to do so. That being said, you need to be the expert. So that way you yeah. can convey to them how your methods do comport with their goals. So you need to go through the process and get real strong. Yeah. Yeah. Get a big butt. <laughs> uh, okay. Lipsy Chris asks, uh, what frequency of gaining and cutting is optimal for a general strength trainee lose, uh, looking to net lose fat and gain muscle? none that like there's no answer to that question yeah uh and because so <laughs> it because it go depends for it. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> it just depends it depends where you're at right now right where your level of training is and so you're asking me the frequency so how often or how many times you need to gain and cut gain and cut well it, that all depends right are you a, do you respond super super well to a caloric you know uh, uh, uh surplus where you gain a ton of muscle or when you go to start dieting um, you know and adding an extra conditioning do you get super super lean if you're a slow responder to both well guess what it's going to be more frequent it's going to take longer right where are you starting out at the beginning are you already like pretty lean and carry some good muscle like again this all depends so there is no there is no sort of like the rule of thumb here it doesn't exist your personal journey is going to be your personal journey which should also tell you that when you go to listen to these famous people on the Instagram about the process and how it, you know, how long it takes and this and the other, they cannot tell you how long it's going to take 
they don't know for you. They know for them if they even went through it. I also, just as an aside, I really like the Transformation Tuesday posts of people pre-puberty and then after. <laughs> like, oh, look at all the yeah. stuff that I did. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just grew up. I think a good example of this sort of stuff is in a lot of like the exercise science uh, studies where they just end up reporting kind of mean outcome data on people yep. versus putting all the data points because yep. when, when they oftentimes put the data point for every individual subject in the study, yep. the results end up being either completely interpreted completely differently or a lot less impressive than you otherwise thought. Yep. Um, so that's kind of the way that you can take some of these people's advice with a grain of salt. The other thing that I wanted to mention is when you say what frequency of gaining and cutting is optimal for general strength training looking to net lose fat and gain muscle, I agree that it depends where you're starting from. And so especially consider the possibility, I don't know what your situation is right now, but if someone is, you know, what people would typically refer to as like skinny fat, they're like actually small or underweight, but have a disproportionate amount of body fat on them, they might not need to be, you know, deliberately cutting at all. They might just need to train and then train and train and train and their body weight might overall just need to slowly creep up over time and yeah. things might sort themselves out. So that might not be, you know, I have literally never done a deliberate cut ever since yeah. I started training. Okay. I just slowly, I just slowly gained weight. I had inadvertent periods of time where I lost weight, like when work gets terrible, ICU nights, stuff like that. But in terms of from the time I started training when I was relatively under, not relative, I was actually absolutely underweight, just slowly gain, gain, gain weight over the years. Um, okay, so dick. don't assume that you, that everybody needs to be doing bulking and cutting cycles. No. In fact, most people are just under muscled. I would say yes. it particularly, you know, it, even if you're obese, you may be in fact under muscled if you haven't trained. Okay. Daniel Cohen, he's probably a member of the tribe, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Bulging disc occurred during deadlift. What is the treatment? So you first should go back and listen to our injuries podcast that we did with our friend Derek Miles. We talked a lot about back stuff then. Uh, and number two, I would say is that you don't know that it happened during your deadlift. Can't know. Um, you think you did because you did a deadlift. You had some acute pain, perhaps. Uh, it freaked you out. You went to your doctor. Um, he hopefully told you that you don't probably need imaging right now. If you went back a few weeks later and he said, fine, let's get an MRI and it showed a bulging disc and then you assume the bulging disc happened while you were doing the deadlift, which is not necessarily the case. It's in fact more likely that the bulging disc was pre-existing the whole time, it was asymptomatic, and then you had a muscul muscular tweak or a, a facet joint tweak or something during your deadlift and then you went and you attributed it to your bulging disc. So. Uh, I can't tell you whether or not your bulging disc is at all related to whatever you felt during your deadlift. The solution, however, is to deadlift correctly, uh, to lower the load, make sure your technique is correct, load it back up over time, and you should be fine. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add uh, to like what this guy should do, but it's interesting that when you look at like what are the things correlated most with low back pain in general, right? It's like obesity, female. Uh, depressed, like mood disorder, mm -hmm. uh, a physically active job, but then also sedentary. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's just... what is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the main thing is your back may hurt for no reason. Like no identifiable, oh, I did this and this caused it. Like, in fact, I would, I would argue strongly against any like acute thing, unless it was like a pure trauma, like you got, actually got hit by a car and I can see where your spine actually broke in half. And now yeah, or any, any other, of course, like the red flag signs or symptoms that we talk about, you know, urinary incontinence and yep. motor weakness and all that kind of stuff. But for the vast, vast majority of people, again, we don't know enough about your situation to give you specific medical advice here, of course, standard yeah. disclaimers apply. But for the vast majority of people in this situation, their bulging disc is of little concern. They just need to get over the hump and get back training, doing it correctly, and they should do fine. All right. Jacob Anstey asks, how do you guys mentally approach each work set? Oh, geez. Um, I don't know. Just do it. <laughs> yeah. That's it. There's no, like, big, like, self-talk thing. And I actually think positive thinking is not indicated for any athletic 
sort of endeavor because when you start thinking positively you have all like this build up you're like your own hype man you know i imagine you're just in the background of your own head saying yeah it's your boy like just you know like you're about to crush it but then the first time something goes wrong you're like oh no this is all my worst fears it's just like overwhelming sort of negativity so the thing is you're just neutral right it doesn't mean don't psych yourself up don't like you know try to get quote unquote in the zone or like focus right i'm not saying don't focus but what i'm saying is you don't have to positively talk yourself into something you've prepared as best as you can you're focused execute and then the feedback that you're going to get the feedback either you make the set or you don't and then you take that and you say well what could i what could i've done differently to affect the outcome in a as far as my goals yeah. But, but you don't need somebody you don't need somebody being like, okay, now think about all the good things that are happening. It's like, no, because the minute the shit hits the fan, you need a game plan. Right? Was it Mike Tyson's thing? Everybody's got a game plan until you get punched in the mouth. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, you know, um uh, the positive thinking thing is just Yeah. I might approach the bar on a given lift if I have a, a certain technical issue that I've been working on and I have like one cue in mind or something like don't lift your chest too early on the squat or something like that. But it's, I mean, really, I, I just focus and do it, and I don't really actively think about it very much when I train. Yeah. I like, a, like, if it's a really heavy thing or whatever, I uh, I like to close my eyes beforehand just to, like, like for a moment, just to focus. That's my focusing. That's just my little tick. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'll, like, make weird guttural utterances. Yeah. I've Other... Been- other times I'll look around. You like for, a big Rick Ross grunt or something. Yeah, like, like the Hebrew version of Rick Ross. <laughs> also, if there are females around, that's a useful situation. Um, okay. Um, Martin Charlie asks, backgrounding in the deadlift, pros and cons. I'll take this. <laughs> As the resident backgrounder. Yeah, I mean, I, I do. Um, when I weight's heavy or when I screw the wrap up or whatever. Uh, I cannot think of any pros to it really um because you get so cons you get slammed on social media uh the your efficiency has gone down um if you around your upper back i guess a pro technically would be you decrease the range of motion however the con of that is you lose your mechanical advantage to extend your spine at the top and uh fortunately in powerlifting they don't actually judge you for having thoracic extension you just have to have your shoulders behind the bar so which is Mm -hmm. why you can just kind of lean back a little bit versus actually puff your chest out at the top which you'll notice a lot of people don't actually do that one weird trick that one weird trick (laughs) deadlift supremacy (laughs) <laughs> um yeah con is your injury rate higher i don't know i actually don't know that and i think you know somebody might be overconfident if they say that you are for sure um yeah people's spines are more resilient than they think but i still don't let my trainees or try not to let my trainees definitely in person i don't let them uh pull with rounded backs so. yeah and then the other con is if you pull with a rounded back the muscles that are responsible for extending your back don't get trained because they're not doing their job Exactly. So, probably probably don't do it. Don't do not do it. it. Just don't do it. Uh, Insta suckagram. Counting macros for the first time ever. I'm now just realizing how far off I am uh, from hitting my recommended intake of protein. Uh, Three shakes some days still don't hit it, dude. That's bullshit. Just I'm just gonna say that because three shakes a day, by the way, most people are taking protein shakes is like 150 grams of protein a day, leaving you, (laughs) you know, a paltry amount. Of, well, you're assuming he's doing two scoop shakes. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, but that's the way most people do it. So, I would actually advocate for one scoop shakes if you're actually having a good protein supplement. But the problem is, most protein supplements, are yeah, fucking bullshit. Let's, <laughs> like, which here answers another I see question. See where this is going. <laughs> well, so here's the thing. So, any practical dietary tips? Yes, eat protein at every meal. If you're eating More frequency, yeah. If you're eating three to five times a day and you're still not hitting it, all right. Well, eat the five times a day and make sure that every meal has a good source of protein in it. Um, Gomad is not an option. You don't need to do Gomad. Chicken, egg whites, eggs, yo- Greek yogurt, uh, you know, tuna, beef, fish. Like these are all good protein sources. Just have a you know six to eight ounces per meal puts you over 250 grams at the end of the day of protein. So I, again, I have there's no excuse here other than you're just not eating frequently yep. enough. Yep, frequency um, will make it easier. The protein thing is this: if you require two scoops of protein in order to drive muscle protein synthesis, which is the real reason why we eat in the first place, then you have a shitty protein. 
okay? In the protein industry, a couple problems. Problem one is uh, per 100 grams of elemental protein, if you just take it from the actual one of the 10 manufacturers who make protein in the uh, whey protein in the entire world, you're gonna get about 10 grams of leucine, all right, per 100 grams. Now, you, when you fraction this out and you look on the label, you'll see that many manufacturers have actually removed BCAAs from their protein supplement and added in cheap ones like glycine or methionine or whatever because they're cheaper and you can keep the protein count high. All right. So if you'll have to take two scoops of whey protein in order to get enough leucine to drive muscle protein synthesis. And the protein manufacturer makes money because their margin gets greater. They can, some of them will actually just sell the BCAAs because they could just make a second product. And, yeah, it's genius. Yeah, and then the, you know, the consumer's like, oh, wait, this protein's got like 30 grams protein per serving, bro. That's, that's better, right? I'm like, no, that's indication of protein spiking. They're adding either glutamine or creatine or something else. So you shouldn't take any protein that's got creatine in it. That'd be stupid. Uh, glutamine doesn't work. Um, like, just don't yeah, take tor it. Taurine glycine yeah i mean they're part of the amino acid like uh you know glycine you need all of these amino acids but Some you know of it, but... yeah yeah but you don't need a ton of it yeah. you need to look at the bca content of the of the protein and then you need to look at the source where does it come from if it comes from pea protein or rice protein then by definition that is a vegetarian based protein source and the protein digestibility corrected amino acid score pdcaas and the bioavailability of that protein is not as good as whey protein, which requires you to take double the dose, that is double the calories, to get the same effect. So a pea protein or a rice protein not only is less calorically efficient, you need to have more cal calories to get the same benefit, right? <laughs> it's more expensive, right? It, 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 you're basically, there's no reason at that point to take a protein supplement. If you have to buy pea protein or rice protein for whatever, just don't take it, right? Same thing with beef protein, beef isolate protein. It's 90% as effective as whey. It's double or triple the cost. Yeah. <laughs> so per unit of NPS that you're going to get out of it. Exactly. It, it's so, and then, then, and then, if you are happen to be sponsored by one of these companies and you're pushing these proteins, this is on you. You're yeah. the problem. You are the problem in the fitness industry. And I hope that all of these companies go under because they're full of shit. All right. They don't deserve to be selling supplements. They don't deserve your money. Dad's mad. You went over a minute, bro. Uh, Dad's mad. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. I know Jordan posted about a study of energy drinks possibly raising systolic blood pressure by like four millimeters of mercury, which you should know is within the error of just checking. Yeah. Exactly. But what else has been shown by evidence-based medicine regarding drinking energy drinks? See, that's the thing. You look at like these studies and they're either observational, right? Or they're consensus statements. So you have, you know, like military studies will look at, oh, look, they're drinking all these energy drinks and there's an increased rate of report of like atrial fibrillation, all right, in their, in their cohort. But what you also have to understand is that their cohort in the military, that age range, that's like, First, you know, oh, they may get palpitations anyway, given their their job requirements, their sleep schedules, this all this other stuff. You know, uh, it may not be the energy drinks. Yeah, yeah. yeah not I, I personally don't really drink them that often. I know you're like what an orange monster guy or something like that. I just drink more coffee, but yeah, sometimes I want something cold. I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't definitely. I don't know if he's implying that the the four millimeters of mercury is bad, but. That's so not. that we're on the record and clear, that's not significant. Yeah, and it raises your heart rate by 0.8. <laughs> so does me, like, breathing an extra time here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, when you're on the can, like, I want to know what your heart rate is. <laughs> your heart rate is... Well, well, yes, just plain old sinus arrhythmia that we all have does the same thing. So. Uh, Natty underscore 24, who is the strongest person connected to starting strength? Define connected. Yeah. So do we have to say, like, is a starting strength coach? Then it depends on the lift, I suppose, no? Yeah, yeah I think it depends. <laughs> I think it depends. I will go on record in saying that I have the highest deadlift. Carl Schitt probably has the highest bench, 460. Yeah. And then I think you have I think, the No, I think Wolf might have beaten him on the bench. I don't know. They're both in that range, 460 range or something like that. And I think you have the highest sleeved squat. It's six, uh, it's 600. So. Or Nick D'Agostino. Uh, Nick, 
D'Agostino. I think he might have done 606 at the at uh, the the Open a couple of years. I don't know. Yeah. He, he was much larger than me, but <laughs> yeah, although no one's counting. Uh, what's his name? Who who has the best press? I think Wolf thing. Wolf, Wolf or D'Agostino? Oh no no Reynolds has, Reynolds has Reynolds. done like three fifteen or three oh eight or something three hundred. He's pressed three hundred. Interesting. I don't know. You weren't there, but this past weekend when we were at the seminar, uh, Chase Lindley pressed three hundred, dude, at age nineteen. Yeah, he's disgusting. a decent football player. He doesn't count. He's cheating. He's been hanging out with Rip for the past seven years. Yeah, that and athletic stuff. Yeah, he's a freak. Yep. Uh, more balance. I'm not answering that. Let's see. All right, we're gonna go to my questions. We're moving over. Any right. advice for deadlifting with a partially torn hip labrum? I have bilaterally torn hip labrums. Can still deadlift. Yeah, it depends on, you know, I mean, we'd have to double check your setup and make sure it looks okay. But if you're still having pain, even with a correct setup as we would teach it, then we might need to play with your setup a little bit. Might need to change toe angle, where your knees are, how your hips are positioned. And if we do all that and we're still not able to get anything, we might have to have you kind of work from an elevated height and do some rack pulls or something until things kind of calm down. But I would expect that we could get you down to the floor. There's really mechanistically not a reason why a torn labrum would prevent you from being able to pull off the floor. Yeah, you may just need to decrease your frequency of squatting and deadlifting and alter your stance on your squat as well to just let the thing settle down. But then yeah. you can go Then you can go train. Yeah. Kazin Power asks, for someone who doesn't want to move to an upper-lower split after a linear progression, how would you recommend setting up a heavy-light-medium split? Uh, heavy-light-medium is not a split. And, and it, depend, it, de- it depends. I can't answer these questions. <laughs> no, but it's a it's a full body routine every day, so it's not a split. Um, so I'd recommend doing a squat, a press, and a pull each time. One that's heavy, one that's light, and one that's in between. <laughs> Probably. And I think it's actually deal, better. But... I think it's actually better thought about as like a high fatigue, medium fatigue, low fatigue. So you could theoretically use the same movements on each three days, but just sure. alter the loading, uh, the rep range, and the amount of volume. Um, so, you know, if you want I, to I know, I know Andy at least has written about it both ways where you do the same movement and alter those other variables, or you do an inherently lighter or less fatiguing movement or something. And so there's lots of different ways to do it. And we don't know anything about you to give you specific advice on how to set up your own HLM type template. So, uh, Blake Byrne asks for Cardi bomb. I just want to let you know that that's now a thing. Uh, <laughs> one has to go forever. Either Adidas NMDs, deadlifting and cough or coffee, which is going. NMDs, the yeah, yeah, it's gonna be the shoes. I even know that, and I don't even clown, care about shoes. <laughs> clown question: uh, What do you guys think makes somebody a good coach, both online and in person? Also, what do you guys think makes somebody a bad coach? I like this question. I like this question too. Uh, I'll, definitely... <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think the things that make somebody a good coach, uh, good sort of um, functional like background, just background knowledge. Because you have to have it uh, mainly to assess, be able to assess both the uh, client and then also like the uh, sort of um, uh, return on on the the the, the uh, intervention. So uh, basically, what I mean by that is you need to have a knowledge of what are the current things that we know about training, what are the current things we know about injuries, what are the current things we know about nutritional interventions, if that's what you do, um, and then you're able to better assess outcomes that way. So somebody without any sort of like formalized training it's gonna be very very difficult for that for me to consider them a good coach just because they're lacking that background knowledge and when somebody says oh i'm self-educated and i'm like okay but there's a lot of stuff lacking in that right if you just haven't been exposed and you that's that's thing one um they also have to have gone through the process themselves yeah I can't be a running coach because i've never while i have done conditioning to a level that has improved my conditioning I don't feel comfortable, even with all of my knowledge, to be a running coach. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to have gone through the process. Doesn't mean you have to be a you know a stud at the thing. In fact, I would say, you know, Rip always makes this this case about oh well, you don't you know the best the best performers aren't necessarily the best coaches, right? And then Tushar had this Facebook uh, post mm-hmm. where he's like, wait, you're telling me you want somebody who's bad at their. Uh... <laughs> At, the, at their sport and I, I think I think the the thing is happy medium you yeah, exactly so for instance the 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 remember when Travis Mash ripped on rip mm-hmm. it was like oh this guy's you know nobody whatever like well rip squatted over 600 you know that's not exactly like 
untrained. In yeah. fact, you would lump that in like the top 0. 0.0, you know, 0. 0.05 percent yeah. of all people who have ever squatted, ever. So he's on the same, you know, breath as Mash or you know Tate, or whoever you want to say is like the you know these high level squatters that classically get their business because they've done a lot, right? Yeah. The the training outcome they've gone through the process, but they need to show that they understand the process. So for like a powerlifting coach, if somebody goes to a meet and goes four for nine, like you can effectively say. They don't understand the process, <laughs> like unless they got unless they got hurt, right? Yeah. Or yeah. if it's a nutrition coach who misses their weight class, or if it's uh, you know or has never been lean, like they don't obviously don't understand that process, and so it doesn't mean that they can't help on some level, but because there's such a big market here, you don't have to settle. You don't have to settle yeah. for that. Yeah. Um, so things that make people a bad coach: uh, Dunning Kruger effect, being overconfident, not being able to mm. you know understand your limitations. Um, that's probably, dude. Yeah, definitely the biggest. Not understanding your own limitations is enormous. Yeah, per, yeah. Uh, sort of, you know, personal communication style where people are have like personality disorders and effectively <laughs> like, <laughs> super crazy online. Um, and then just having such a biased sample size that they again don't understand the process how it applies broadly. So this is I see this all the time actually in CrossFit with these coaches who don't actually work with rig gen pop folks or how they do is they just give them a template and they don't see how this goes. So these people don't actually understand the process, even if they have performed at a certain, at a, at a high level. Um, so anybody who advertises they're a macro coach, anybody who advertises that they can coach anybody on anything, functional movement <laughs> pattern folks, kettlebell people, uh, animal flow people, uh, <laughs> move nat. I'm just, you know, all, all, bad coaches doesn't mean that people don't get some benefit that's not what I, this is like going to a chiropractor people get benefits out of going to but i'm just saying um that's in general how i would uh how i would stratify you're saying they're bad in the same way that you that you say 531 is bad not that nobody has ever gotten results out of it but there are better options there are much better options for you to yeah. part with your hard-earned cash yes yes i agree yeah. i mean it definitely comes down to the person Having been through the process, uh, having a kind of a broad understanding of, of the, both the process and how to generalize it to different types of people, um, being good communicators, um, just yeah, those are those are just big, big, big parts of being a good coach. And uh, yeah, I, I don't have a lot more. I'll just end up repeating a lot of the stuff that you said, so I'll have a lot more to add on top of that. All right. Uh, let's see. Best way to train if you got to work and go to school Monday through Friday. <laughs> uh, I'm jealous that you go to school Monday through Friday. <laughs> yeah, sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, how do you not train? That's a better question. <laughs> uh, all right. Dramar Sally asks, seriously, what's bad about 531? I heard from tons of people who've had success using it. Jordan wrote an article. Can we not? Can we just not? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let me just say this. So if people listen to this, first read the article because the article is lengthy. Sure. sure. 531 has suboptimal volume, exercise frequency, training intensity, and exercise selection. If you modify those variables to comport with what we currently know about training, it is no longer 531. There are people who have said that they're doing 531 and have totally modified the program to such an extent that it's no longer 531. That's fine, but that just ultimately that supports my argument. And sure. then and then people say, oh well, five through one is this other. Have you heard of this particular like you know spin on it? And I'm like, I mean, no, but if it <laughs> if it if it contains any of the original intensity and you know AMRAP sets at the end, it's suboptimal for any outcome other than supporting five through one economically. This doesn't mean Jim Wendler's a bad guy, although. He is a bad guy for after posting what he posted and then now not talking to Rip anymore. Yeah. It's just chicken shit. Read the fucking article, Jim. Read the article. Boom. All right. Let's debate. Somebody was like, do you want to debate Wendler? I'm like, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Happy to. Okay. Just finished a meet and want to include more bench volume this next cycle, but have a pinch in my left shoulder that comes around here and there. Ideas or alternatives to work with bench without further inflaming the shoulder. It's solid during the bench reps itself, but shoulder accessories like presses hurt. Oh, uh, that's weird. Okay. Yeah. So this guy's bench feels fine. 
uh, and he wants to bench more. So you can probably go ahead and bench more. Um, you can you could do more benching. You could use slingshot bench. Would be a lot of you know a couple a couple good options. But I also want to know why you're having this pinch in your shoulder. Why your presses hurt because they shouldn't. Yeah, um, I would think that he's actually just pressing after he's benching. So while he's benching, it's fine, and then he goes to press, and during presses, it hurts. Not maybe that presses. Shouldn't. It still shouldn't. Well, so. ideally, yeah. <laughs> but the other thing is, he's right after a meet. I'd probably have him not. I mean, I would not. This is not the time. Then there's a cute phase post meet. I don't think anyway. If someone just finished a meet, I think those first three or four weeks, provided they're not like a complete novice, sure. I don't think that's the time to pump up the bench volume. Let it heal so you can actually train. So yeah, that means I'm not, you, I'm not especially clear on what's actually going on in your shoulder. Same. So, same. Yeah. Same. It may be nothing. It's probably nothing. But it may be something. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Would you say that starting strength LP would be the absolute perfect program for high school football or other sports teams? And why don't more teams do it? It's, <laughs> it's good if they're novices and have the appropriate resources to train. Yeah, it, it, it'll, yeah, it'll work for novices. That's what, that's kind of like the claim to fame of the program as it'll work for essentially every novice, uh, whether or not it's the absolute perfect program, which is kind of a ridiculous uh, way what to describe a program. I would never say program. that about anything. So, um, yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go that far just because it's kind of preposterous to say that, but it'll work fine. Uh, what is the best path to becoming a starting strength coach? There is a conveniently titled article How to called become... "The Path to Become <laughs> the Path to the Starting Strength Coach Credential," written by one Dr. Tom Campitelli, uh, honorary doctorate. Yeah. Um, yeah, go look up the article. It's called The Path to the Starting Strength Coach Credential. You need lots of experience coaching the method. You need to know the material in detail. Definitely takes multiple reads through all the books and yep. kind of thinking through it, applying it to a wide variety of people, fix, experience fixing lots of different problems. Yep. You show up to the seminar, you pass the platform. Well, you probably don't, but you try to. And then if you pass the platform, then you get the essay test and you have to knock that out of the park and then you can become a starting strength coach. That's the, the short version. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Therapy for plantar fasciitis. Well, so, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Well, so we don't even know what causes plantar fasciitis. Yeah, we don't think it's that it's thing. inflammatory based. We don't think that it's, you know, uh, certain, you know, tissue trauma. We don't really know. And there's actually this really strange, like posterior Achilles, like, bursitis and tendinopathy there's like a it's a syndrome i forgot what it's called now but there's like a heel bump oh it's a, a pump syndrome or heel syndrome mm. it's, it's originally was first described with female or people wearing high heels yeah uh also trivia who was the first known person to wear high heels i have no idea <laughs> uh, it's king Ar king arthur what <laughs> apparently this is that was my first guess damn yeah yeah almost had it almost had it what, no, noble males were wearing heels, probably oh. having plantar fasciitis. Good times. Good times, great oldies. <laughs> In any event, uh, I think that we don't... Re the reason why there are so many treatments for it is because we haven't found anything that works reliably. So, you know, some people will say, uh, you, know, foam, you know, like rolling their foot out of the bottom at the end of the day with a frozen water bottle is useful because I think it ices it and you get some, like, you know, light stretching. Um, other people wearing braces at night, like orthotics, um... Mm -hmm. Other, you know, one thing I found is I had really bad foot pain when I wasn't wearing my weightlifting shoes when I was deadlifting or shoes with any support. It just happened over time. Mm -hmm. So in any event, I don't think we really know. Yeah. The standard advice you're going to get is a whole lot of different types of stretching. Um, there are fancy gadgets that, you know, I've kind of learned about through some sports medicine people. Uh, they have this thing called a Strasbourg sock that they'll oftentimes prescribe to people. It's this sock where basically the toe part of the sock like is like tied back and like attaches to your shin so it basically holds your foot in dorsiflexion like all night when you're sleeping and that supposedly stretches it out um if you want some more information on this i'm going to refer you to one of my favorite sources on pain musculoskeletal stuff go to painscience.com he has uh, he has a bunch of stuff on there on all these sorts of injuries and and tendon issues and aches and pains and one of which is the plantar fasciitis syndrome so you can go take a look and see if he has anything useful for you there uh, slight correction. Pump bump is uh, <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. The name attributed to it. It's called Haglund syndrome, hmm. insertional Achilles tendinopathy, retrocalcaneal bursitis, 
and superficial retro tendon Achilles bursitis. Uh, and the noble person that I was thinking of was King Louis the Fourteenth. So you just got it, you just got it all wrong. I definitely did. I knew it was nobility, <laughs> but right. yeah. All right. All hey, right. fun facts. Uh, last, we got two more questions. Here we go. All right. Uh, you say people should take five grams of creatine per day. I keep forgetting it on my rest days. So if I don't take it Saturday and Sunday, should I take fifteen grams on Monday? Does it matter? Just keep taking it as often as you can remember, and eventually it won't matter anymore. Correct. Uh, hey, I, I lied. Just one. So that's was it. that it? That yeah. was it for me. I mean, there's some other questions that we like have answered, but haven't answered, and I think okay. that overall. We, we, we did a pretty good job. And I see yeah. the look in your eyes. Yeah, it's like almost midnight, so I'm going to go ahead and get some sleep. <laughs> well, forget, I'm two hours ahead of you. <laughs> right, and I don't sleep, and you do. Um, okay, so thanks for joining me. We'll be back in the near future. And thanks for your questions, everybody. Thanks for listening. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to add two things here. Number oh. one, if you had your question answered, you are hereby required to go on iTunes and leave a review. Ooh, that would be great. I'll say that. Yeah, anyone no, that... else, anyone else is highly encouraged to. You don't necessarily have to. But those who have their questions answered, I'm going to say you're required to. Of course, I have no way of enforcing this, but it'd be very helpful. So please do that. Yeah, and I, I think the other if, thing. Yeah, go ahead. I think if our reviews don't go up by like at least like 20, then we just we're going to know something's up. Yeah, we have to like boycott doing Instagram lives for a while <laughs> or something. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the other thing is that. Um, we recently announced that we're going to be doing a seminar down here in San Antonio in September. Uh, so you all should look into that and register. Come on down. We're going to be doing uh, lots of lectures in depth material on various uh, medical topics that we commonly get asked about, debunking BS as we tend to do. And you're also going to get live in-person coaching from us on the basic barbell lifts as well. So it should be a good weekend. So sign up and come down to San Antonio and visit. Yes, there is a link in my bio. It's on the Eventbrite page. And uh, we'll be pimping that thing until it sells out. So yeah, make it happen, people. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right, guys. See you. So, see you later, man. Bye.